All right, here we are, our class on Exodus, uh, Exodus for Beginners. We're on lesson number three. And the title of this lesson is um, Deliverance One, uh, Moses Answers the Call. We'll be reading from uh, Exodus chapter three uh, to uh, chapter five, verse 23. So a little review here. In our previous lesson, we read about the uh, plight of the oppressed Israelites in Egypt and Moses, a Jewish baby, cast away in the river, but rescued and eventually taken into the royal court by an Egyptian princess. We also learn of Moses as a young man uh, attempting to lead his people in some way but ending up fleeing Egypt to escape the consequences of his killing of a fellow Egyptian while trying to defend a Jewish uh, countryman. This brings uh, Moses into the employ and family through marriage of Jethro, a priest of uh, the uh, Most High God in the country of Midian, where the Midianite people are related to the Jews. Uh, since uh, I mentioned this last time, they're uh, their heritage, like Moses, also begins with Abraham, but uh, it runs down through Keturah, uh, who was Abraham's wife after Sarah, his first wife, died. So Moses' life is firmly uh, uneventful for 40 years as he tends sheep and raises a family in the safety and the obscurity of uh, Midian. All of this, of course, changes as one day, the Lord calls to him amidst the miraculous scene of a bush that was burning with fire, but not destroying the bush itself, a sign of God's eternal presence among temporal mankind. From this burning bush, God relates the suffering and pleas for deliverance from Moses' people, the Israelites who are in Egypt, and he calls upon Moses to lead them to their promised land. So the next part we will pick up on in this lesson today is the reply. So Moses is called upon to be the deliverer. And despite the miracle before his eyes uh, and his previous attempt to free his uh, people, Moses is reluctant to believe that God is calling on him to lead his people. I mean, he believes that you know, what he's seeing is a miracle. He believes that God is calling him to something, uh, but uh, he's reluctant. His response is, surely not me, Lord. Send somebody else, send somebody who's qualified, send somebody who's gifted, send someone who's suitable. And so there are kind of four rounds of you know, dialogue between God and Moses as they go round and round about you know, uh, whether Moses is going to be the one who's going to uh, answer the call. So we'll take a look at these. Round one, his uh, argument is, um, I'm a nobody. I'm just a nobody. So we read in Exodus chapter three, it says, therefore come now and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, certainly I will be with you and this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. And so God outlines the plan, if you wish. You're going to go to Pharaoh. You're going to tell him that God wants his people to leave Egypt. Uh, so Moses responds that, well, he's in no position to go to the king and make demands. You know, he's a nobody. Who's going to listen to him? He's a shepherd in the middle of nowhere in, in Midian. In response, God tells him that he won't be alone. The Lord will be with him. Also, he'll know it was God with him because after they come out of Egypt, they'll worship God at the very same place where he received the original call. In other words, where they are standing now, uh, the people will gather and worship once uh, Moses brings them out of, the, um, out of Egypt. 
So we go to round number two in this uh, second encounter. Uh, Moses complains that if he is to lead the people, why would they follow him? Uh, they're going to question his authority. The underlying point is that uh, I'm a nobody, uh, so who is going to follow me? And God equips him with the only authority that he'll need, that he is being sent by the true and living God, not one of the pagan deities of the uh, area or of the era. And so he tells Moses his name and his identity. I am who I am. This is the one sending him. He is the Lord, the God worshiped by Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. This same God who made promises to the patriarchs you know, has heard the prayers of the, uh, of the people. And so he tells Moses to gather the elders of the people and say to them that he is aware of their sufferings in Egypt and he's going to lead them to their promised land. He then instructs Moses to go to the Pharaoh with the elders and tell him that the Lord has instructed them to ask this ruler to release the Israelites to go on a three day journey so that they can sacrifice to the Lord. Now he warns them that at first Pharaoh will refuse and will only relent when forced, which the Lord will do miraculously. So you know, God is laying out the plan before them. He's telling them ahead of time what's going to take place. He describes what will happen when they will leave the Israelites, uh, or rather when they leave, God describes the situation where the Israelites will be given gold and silver and clothing by the Egyptians as they depart. In other words, they will plunder the Egyptians without even lifting a finger against them. So, you know, that, that kind of information, you know, that would, that would, you know, you would think that would strengthen you. Uh, here's the plan. I'm even telling you, you know, what's going to happen and, and, and I'll be with you. God says, I'll be with you. But uh, Moses uh, continues to uh, vacillate uh, round three of the discussion, uh, his, his main question is, why would they even believe me? You know, I, I understand what you're saying to me, but why would they believe me if I told them this? And so we read in uh, chapter four, beginning in verse one, it says, then Moses said, what if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, the Lord has not appeared to you. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. Then he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses fled from it. But the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand and caught it and it became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has appeared to you. The Lord furthermore said to him, now, put your hand into your bosom. So he put his hand into his bosom and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then he said, put your hand into your bosom again. So he put his hand into his bosom again and when he took it out of his bosom, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you or he the witness of the first sign, they may believe the witness of the last sign. But if they will not believe even these two signs or heed what you say, then you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground and the water which you take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. So Moses now circles back to an old argument stating that even if he gets before the Pharaoh and his leaders, what will he do if they just don't believe that he's been sent by the Lord? And at this point, as we have read, God provides him with three signs that he can produce to, prov to, to prove that his claims are, are true. Uh, first of all, the transformation of his staff into a snake and then back into a staff and, and, and doing that at his bidding. The second miracle, the changing of his healthy flesh to leprosy and then back again to healthy flesh uh, at will. And the third one, the converting of the water of the Nile River 
uh, to blood. And so these signs were powerful enough to convince the Jews that Moses was a prophet sent from God and uh, substantial to convince the Pharaoh who was considered as a God by the Egyptians that Moses had uh, formidable power uh, only possessed by the gods and so someone that he needed to listen to. In other words, the Jews would believe him and even if he showed these signs to the, uh, to the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh would have to recognize that uh, Moses was just not an ordinary uh, Jew. There was something special about him. No one could perform these signs without having some sort of you know, deity uh, uh, powering these things. Well, you'd think that would be enough, but there's still one more round here of discussion, round four. And uh, uh, this time uh, Moses just pleads for a way out. It's, in other words, well, this is all good and you know, yeah, it might work, but uh, I just don't want to go, period. Please send anybody else, but, but not me. And so we read in uh, chapter four, uh, beginning in verse 10, it says, then Moses said to the Lord, please Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, or, uh, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. The Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go and I, even I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. But he said, please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses and he said, is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently and moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth and I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what you are to do. Moreover, he shall speak for you to the people, and he will be as a mouth for you, and you will be as God to him. You shall take in your hand this staff with which you shall perform the signs. So as I said, this time Moses tries to excuse and plead his way out of this, uh, this mission. Now, the first time he does it, uh, he pleads lack of eloquent speech. Uh, the idea being he didn't have the skill to speak to men of high position, even though he had been brought up and educated at the royal court as the son of a, an Egyptian princess. So he understood about you know, royalty and court life and uh, you know, the do's and the don'ts. He had been raised in that, and yet uh, you know, he declines the offer to, to, um, uh, to be God's uh, smoke, spokesman. He, he uh, emphasizes that he's always had problems uh, of one kind or another as far as speech is concerned. So the Lord responds that his, uh, you know, uh, he is the one that controls the speech of all men and it'll be, it'll be him speaking through Moses and not Moses himself. You know, God is saying to him, look, I'm going to talk for you. I'm God, I've invented speech. So you don't have to worry that you're not a good uh, speaker. And so uh, Moses makes another effort. The second round, if you wish, uh, sees Moses out of excuses, simply pleading with God to send somebody else. In other words, anybody but me, anyone but me. And so God's answer is to fortify Moses with human help in the person of his older brother, Aaron. Um, the Lord assures Moses that Aaron will gladly follow him, that God will speak to Moses and Moses will relay to Aaron and Aaron will speak Moses' words to the people. And aside from one occasion later on, Aaron will submit to Moses and his instructions as if these were coming from God. And Moses uh, would be like a prophet in the eyes of Aaron. So there are no more objections from Moses. And as he prepares to go, God reminds him to bring his shepherd's staff with which he will perform miracles uh, before Pharaoh and the uh, Israelites. 
And so at this point, Moses prepares his departure, chapter four, verses 18 to 23. Uh, at this point, he prepares his family. He receives a blessing and assurances from his father-in-law, Jethro, uh, that it is safe to return. And he makes his way back to Egypt, providing a donkey, it says in the text that he provides a donkey, suggests uh, transportation for his wife and perhaps his youngest son, perhaps a small child, um, for the long journey ahead. Along the way, God speaks again to Moses and lays out in a brief summary the details of what will happen when he faces Pharaoh. You know, Moses knows in advance what's going to happen. God prepares him for that. First, he says, Moses will perform miracles and God will harden Pharaoh's heart in refusing to release the people. And we'll discuss that idea a little bit later on, the meaning of that, uh, you know, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Uh, and uh, uh, Moses will warn Pharaoh, but in the end, only the killing of every firstborn child and animal in Egypt will move the Pharaoh into releasing the people. So way ahead of time, Moses knows what the script is going to be. He knows what the script is going to be. He knows the end. God tells him, you know, you'll eventually be released, but not until you know, that 10th plague takes place. So now we arrive at a, an unusual verse, uh, hard to understand in Exodus uh, 4 verse 24, that has to do with the term, the bridegroom of blood. So in verse 24, it says, now it came about at the lodging place on the way that the Lord met him and sought to put him uh, to death. And so this is a, an obscure passage that does not seem to fit the, you know, the larger narrative. It seems like it's just thrown in there, but not related to anything else. And it uses the unusual expression, a bridegroom of blood. We'll read that in verse 25 and 26. So let's break it down uh, you know, to, to try to understand this passage. It really, as I was preparing this lesson, it really appealed to me the idea that I've read this many times, but not, not quite understand it. And I think a lot of others don't understand it either. So we're going to spend a little time trying to decipher the exact meaning of this and how it fits in to the narrative uh, so far. So uh, there's only three people mentioned in this uh, verse here, in these three verses, 24 to 26. Um, first of all, uh, the Lord, the angel of the Lord, which is the Lord, you know, when I said the, the Lord that appears as an angel in the Old Testament. Uh, the next character is Zipporah, uh, who is Moses' Midianite wife. She's the mother of his two sons. She's the daughter of Jethro, the priest of the Most High God. And then there's Moses' son. He has two, one is Gershom, he's the older, and Eliezer is the youngest. We read about him in Exodus chapter 18. Now, probably his youngest son, uh, since Moses was circumcised and had probably circumcised his firstborn son, but for some reason had not yet uh, done so for the younger child. So Moses has gathered his family. He's begun the journey back to Egypt to mobilize his people, to gather the elders and to make his request to Pharaoh in order to release the Israelites. In other words, he's, you know, he's, uh, he's on the mission. He's on the mission, but while uh, they're at a lodging because it says now it came about at the lodging place. So while they're at a lodging place en route, the Lord appears to Zipporah, the wife, and the child, the younger child who is uncircumcised because the him there, it says that the Lord met him. That, that, doesn't, refer to, uh, that doesn't refer to Moses, that refers to the son. Uh, there are even some translations uh, in the margins that say either Moses or his son. And I, you know, I, it makes a lot more sense uh, that um, uh, on the way the Lord met him, the son 
and sought to put him to death. Now why would that be? Well, God had said that all males had to be circumcised or they were cut off from the people. In Genesis 17, it says, you know, but an uncircumcised male shall be cut off from his people. And so the judgment was literally falling on Moses' younger child, the man sent by God to liberate the Jewish people. I mean, his own son was outside of the covenant and about to be killed as opposed to being discovered later on and you know, compromising, compromising his father's leadership. Can you imagine? Uh, you know, uh, they find out later on that Moses, the leader, the great leader, never bothered to circumcise his, his younger son. So uh, the situation is similar, if you wish, to David's illegitimate son with Bathsheba, the one that was conceived in adultery. Uh, that child was taken, right? He, he died. Uh, lest he become the heir to David's throne and compromise its legitimacy and its spiritual nature. You couldn't have the son of an adulterous relationship uh, inherit the throne, uh, you know, the spiritual center of, uh, of uh, uh, Judaism. So we read in uh, verse 25 and 26, it says, then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and threw it at Moses' feet. And she said, you are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. At that time, she said, you are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. So we see Zipporah circumcises the child and she touches the child's feet with the foreskin. Not Moses, who has not been mentioned in all of this passage. Again, there's some passages, you know, there's a debate as to how exactly they should be translated and this is one of them. The touching of the child's feet could be the completion of the ritual as the Midianites practiced it, signifying that the entire body has been sanctified and thus saved from destruction. Here's a, a helpful reconstruction of the scene provided by Garrett's uh, commentary mentioned to you earlier on that I use several commentaries to you know, dig up some information. So I'm just going to read word per word uh, this uh, particular uh, section in the uh, commentary. It says, we might therefore suggest the following reconstruction of the story behind this text. Moses and Zipporah set out for Egypt. Along the way, their son suddenly became deathly ill. Zipporah recognized that the boy needed to be circumcised and she did the act with a flint knife. Flint can be more finely sharpened than can bronze and is therefore better for performing surgery. After the removal of the foreskin, she ritually touched the boy's feet or genitals with her hand or the flint while saying, you are hatan damim to me. In other words, a member of my community by virtue of the blood of circumcision. These formulaic words concluded the circumcision ceremony. The act formalized the inclusion of the boy in the community. After that, the boy recovered. Zipporah had turned aside the wrath of God. And so this is a much clearer explanation of that particular obscure passage. Uh, Moses in the rush to, to organize and get going and so on and so forth neglects to circumcise his youngest son. His youngest son is threatened with death uh, and uh, Zipporah, a believer uh, in the God of uh, the Jews, the mighty God, um, uh, she has to be a, a believer. There's no argument from her as far as you know, the trip and going and so on and so forth. But we see her faith. She recognizes immediately what is taking place. She circumcises the child, she does the ritual, and the child is safe. And they just move on. There's no commentary on it. They just kind of move on. 
you know, uh, 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 realizing that whoever is reading that probably understands. So we continue with the deliverance uh, and the next uh, part of that deliverance, uh, Moses is ready to go, ready to face the Pharaoh and uh, he will uh, experience uh, an initial failure. So let's continue reading, this time from verse 27. It says, now the Lord said to Aaron, go to meet Moses in the wilderness. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the sons of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. He then performed the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed and when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, then they bowed low and worshiped. So I want you to note that Aaron is called by God also. No details are given. However, he enthusiastically greets his brother and takes in without doubt or hesitation all that Moses shares with him. And note that Aaron, you know, he takes on his role immediately in that he does both the speaking to the Jewish leaders and he performs the signs, both of which were first given to Moses by God. And so this initial meeting resulted in the faith of people in the persons of Moses and Aaron and the message that they proclaimed, and that was freedom from Egyptian slavery. The witness of their faith was the humble, in other words, the bowing down, the humble worship they offered God based on the message they had received from the two brothers. And so we go from this scene to now the first meeting with the Pharaoh in chapter five. Moses and Aaron have momentum. The people believe the miracles and the message and they bless their mission to go before the Pharaoh to demand in the name of God their immediate release. So we read in chapter five, a first meeting with Pharaoh. And afterward, Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and besides, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us, please, let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Otherwise he will fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you draw the people away from their work? Get back to your labors. Again, Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now many and you would have them cease from their, uh, from their labors. So one thing we need to know about the Pharaoh is that he too considered himself to be a God, as well as uh, the so-called God of these Jewish slaves who now had the temerity to challenge not only his exalted position as the leader and king of mighty Egypt, they also suggested that their God might be greater, uh, a greater divine force than himself. And his response is, well, we'll see about that. You know, nobody's ever challenged him uh, on that level. And so Moses uh, asks for only three days uh, to organize a corporate worship of the Jewish people. And this was actually, you know, it was a fairly reasonable request. I mean, according to the times, you know, the Egyptians, they had numerous feasts throughout the year to honor various gods, which required them to be away from their work. So there was nothing new. You know, what Moses was asking was nothing spectacular. Having the feast away from the city in the desert could not be an offense against the Egyptian population who despised the Jews and their religion anyways. Now Moses didn't ask to leave for good this time. 
only three days for the journey and the time for the worship. And the worship had been commanded by their God. And Egyptians knew the seriousness of this because they also had worship obligations that would bring uh, curses on them if they disobeyed. So what I'm saying here, there was nothing new here. There was nothing threatening here. There was nothing you know, that, that was out of the ordinary uh, you know, that Moses and Aaron was asking for. Of course, we're familiar with the Pharaoh's arrogant and dismissive uh, response. He dismisses their request as a cover for laziness and he increases the degree of difficulty of their task by no longer providing the straw for the making of the bricks while maintaining the same you know, production quotas. In those days, you know, bricks were made with mud mixed with straw, which was kneaded by, by foot and then you know, placed in a form to uh, dry in the, in the sun. Uh, to force the Jews to collect their own straw while demanding the same quota was Pharaoh's way of breaking the spirit of the people because their sheer number and strength actually posed a threat to him uh, and to his rule uh, of the nation. And so the passage describes the loss of faith in Moses and Aaron's plan and the consequences for the people. You know, even, uh, even pleas by the Israelite foremen are rejected by the Pharaoh as lazy excuses to avoid, uh, you know, to avoid doing their jobs. So in the end, the Jewish leaders return you know, to their work and they blame Moses and Aaron for giving the king an excuse to annihilate their people. And so the first attempt to deliver the people is an abject failure. At this point, uh, Moses returns to God in prayer, acknowledging that this whole idea was a failure from the start since their meeting with the Pharaoh resulted in worse conditions for the people and not better conditions. In his prayer, you can almost hear Moses say, I told you this wouldn't work in accusing God himself of the failure. So we'll, we'll, we'll stop our, you know, our study of the, the text right at this point, because I, I think there are a couple of lessons that we can draw from uh, Moses' experience uh, with the Pharaoh uh, in the passages that we've read. Uh, the first lesson is, is this. When dealing with God, you have to interact with him by faith, not by reason. With humans or human organizations, you use logic, you use persuasion, reason, clarity of thought and speed, among other things. But to make a point or to understand or to cooperate or to succeed in a joint effort in getting things done or getting what you want or need. Uh, you need those type of things when dealing with human or worldly matters. God, however, who speaks stars into existence, who defeats armies with a single angel, who begins a baby's life through his Holy Spirit or raises the dead with a single command he does not deal with man using the tools that humans use to interact with each other. Our relationship with God is based on faith, not reason. All things are possible for those who believe, God says in Mark 9, 23. He didn't say all things are possible for those who reason it out carefully, who logically think it through. He says, all things are possible for those who believe. And so this failure Moses experienced had more to do with teaching how to properly relate to God and less about how to convince the Pharaoh. God even told Moses that he would fail in this first attempt back in Exodus chapter four, verse 21. And Moses' reaction simply demonstrated that he didn't really believe that this would happen. You know, many times when things go wrong or you have fear or discouragement 
and you think you're not understanding God, don't examine your plan, don't examine your prayer, examine your faith and see if you're living, working and serving by faith, not by reason or logic. A second lesson, never doubt God's word. He will always do what he promises. You know, the thing that Moses had to learn was that God could actually do the impossible or what seemed impossible. Just learning that lesson took almost 40 years in the desert. We read in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, he says, Paul says, now these things happened to them, them meaning the people in the Old Testament, Moses, Aaron, Isaac, you know, all those people in the Old Testament, these things happened to them as an example. And they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Paul explains to the church that the past events are recorded so we will have concrete examples of how God operates. And one key lesson taught over and over and over again is that God's word is sure. For example, if he says there is a heaven, there is a heaven. If he says sins are forgiven, then they are completely forgiven. If he warns of punishment, be careful because there will be a punishment. Like Moses, much of our Christian lives are spent learning to believe and trust that God says he will do for you personally, he will do it. Whatever he says he will do for you, he will do it. You can't experience the peace that surpasses understanding that Paul talks about in Philippians chapter four, verse seven, unless you understand that it only comes when we begin taking God at his word and not before. And then lesson number three, if God sends, he provides. This point is especially important to understand if you're involved in serving the Lord in ministry in some way. If you feel called to ministry in the church, uh, any type of call, a call to preach or teach or serve or uh, to, 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 to serve in the area of worship or benevolence or leadership, whatever, know this for sure. If God gives you a task, you can be sure that he will provide what you need to finish that task and to finish it to his glory. Sometimes he provides in unusual ways or ways that you're not used to, or he provides just on time. But if he calls and if he sends you, he will also provide for you. And then it's always three, right? But I, you know, I'm cheating this morning. I give you four lessons. The fourth lesson is it won't be easy. Just because you believe and you're faithful and you're sincerely doing your best to serve the Lord, there will always be trouble, injustice, mistakes, disagreements. Moses was well equipped with Aaron as his spokesman, miracles ready at hand. The Jewish leaders were behind him and look what happened. The Pharaoh wasn't impressed. He literally threw him out of the palace and unjustly punished the people and blamed Moses for their troubles. It happens to us, doesn't it? You try to organize something for the congregation with lots of personal time, lots of effort, and nobody shows up. You volunteer to help a family in need and find out that you've been accused of not minding your own business. You're always ready to serve, to help, to visit, to give. And then your mother dies and no one calls and no one sends a card and no one visits from those that you've visited in the past. You get to the point where you say, why, why should I even try? Why do I even bother? 
At those critical moments when Satan has managed to make your service to God seem worthless or thankless or unnoticed and unappreciated, remember this, uh, Christian truism. God never said that it would be easy, but he did promise that it would be worth it. We read in John chapter 14, verses two to four. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way where I am going, John 14, two to four. That passage, brothers and sisters, is a promise. Every line is a promise. We need to read it as a personal promise for the Lord himself and let his promise energize our faith, motivate our service and comfort us when we grieve or when we're saddened or disappointed because of failure. Not only our failure, but sometimes the failure of those that we have trusted in or we have helped. All right, well, that's our lesson for this time. Uh, next time, come on back. Of course, we'll continue with uh, the uh, book of Exodus, lesson number four. I continue to remind you, if you haven't already, to uh, get yourself a workbook. There's still 10 more lessons to go. They'll be very helpful for you. Uh, they're free. You can download a PDF version of it or order one and get it in a couple of days and uh, be able to uh, follow more easily, I think, uh, the lesson. Plus, there's a lot of material in the workbook that is not in the class, simply because uh, I don't have time to provide it uh, during the class time. Well, that's it for today. Thank you very much. We'll see you, we'll see you next time.